<sighs> Yo, what's going on? What's going on? Welcome, welcome, welcome to the live stream. Welcome to the live stream. Welcome to flynubianqueen.com. Um, come on in. Uh, take some time out right now. Uh, if you have not subscribed to our platform for melanated women such as yourself, call flynubianqueen.com. Please make sure you take some time out right now and go ahead and subscribe to that channel. Uh, also, make sure you check out our new platform that we have called FlyNubianKingTV.com. All right, FlyNubianKingTV.com. Please check that out. Make sure you share that uh, platform uh, with any any man in your life. You know, whether it be brother, sister, father, uncle, cousin, whoever. Uh, please go ahead and share that channel with them because we're gonna be talking about a lot of uh, we're having a lot of conversations that's very relevant to us um, as it pertains to health, finance topics in general all right so uh please make sure you subscribe to both of those channels also text the word queens to 31996 uh text the word queens to 31996 that way you can stay alerted for any time we go live um anytime we have any kind of specials or any kind of deals going on um also like i said please take a take a second out right now and uh make sure you like the video share the video and subscribe to the channel all right especially i really need you all to uh, make sure you share this video okay because i don't know what's gonna happen with this content as far as how long it's going to be up um but it's going to be a pretty uh serious conversation um so since it's going to be so serious let's start off light <laughs> so uh let me know where y'all coming from where y'all at um you know what y'all doing what's going on saturday right now you know it's noon over here on the east coast um so before we get started let's go ahead and start this thing off with a lighter a lighter tone all right so um like i said make sure if you are interested in starting a business uh check out flynewbeingbusiness.com if you're looking to actually uh work on your finances and saving money and uh investing in stocks uh check out flynewbeingbusiness.com everybody in the chat i'll go ahead and hit the like video hit the like video hit the like video uh let me know where you're coming from right now let me know where you're at and uh we're gonna get started with this conversation and uh youtube can everybody hear me okay y'all can hear me okay Y'all can hear me? Good, good, good. All right, good, good, good. All right. So um, you know how I like to start these videos off. <clears throat> I love to start them off with uh quotes. Um, sometimes these quotes are by uh people I consider to be my heroes. Uh, other times they're just quotes that are just really good, they're true. All right. So um the name of this video, the name of this topic that we're gonna have, this conversation is called the marketing and selling of disease, or the marketing and sales of disease. And um, here's what you need to know about it, you know. So I want to make sure uh, that I that I go through and try to give as much detail and give as much uh, citations and uh, resources as possible. Uh, that way, you all can do your own legwork as it pertains to continuing to educate yourself. So please, this is one of those videos where you need to have a pencil and paper available and write down, save this video, uh, download the video if you can, um, you know, record it, whatever you need to do do those things because like i said i don't know i'm just going right now and um this video may get taken down I'm not really sure um but uh make sure you go ahead and do those things okay please so uh my name is edward williams i'm the founder and creator of health by Immune necessary uh my mission is to aggressively inspire and radically improve the health conditions of our community and um the way we're going to do that is by empowering we have to become our our, our primary care providers we have to become our own primary care providers uh, it does not make much sense to rely on outside individuals, outside systems to take care of us. It has never worked out well for us. Uh, once again, I recommend that everybody get a book called Medical Apartheid. Medical Apartheid. And you will, you know, if you have a hard time believing anything that I'm saying, or you feel like I, some of the stuff I'm saying is a little harsh and strange, um, there's a couple of things you need to understand. Uh, one, they sound foreign and strange because you've been thoroughly convinced. We all have. We have been thoroughly convinced. Uh, that we are destined to be sick, uh, that these diseases just run in our vein. Um, we've all also been thoroughly convinced that we need outside intervention. We've been thoroughly convinced of that. And so this is why uh, most of the things that I'm going to be talking about sound strange because uh, for most people, you're not, this, this is going to be information that you've never been told before, um, particularly by your practitioner. And um, I'll explain, you know, why that takes place as well too. Healthcare is no longer healthcare for the most part. Um, it has now become a system of disease management. All right. This means that, you know, we're, we're looking at your metrics, you know, not really the whole person as a whole. 
uh, but more so your metrics, your blood pressure, your your glucose, your cholesterol, your weight. You know, we're looking at the metrics, your blood work, your labs, um, and we want to know, we want to see what we can do to keep them not too high, but not too low. And a lot of times in order for that perfect ratio to always be met, it's going to take chemicals that's going to alter the physiology of the body. And so that's largely what most of healthcare has become. It's become a, a system that is obsessed with metrics and keeping them within a tight threshold. Okay. And um, like I said, my job is to let you know that uh, this is a burning building. This is a burning building. Um, I'm sounding the alarm, letting you know uh, that one, the building is on fire. Uh, two, showing you how to safely get out. And then three, show you how to build your own because we should all be our own primary care providers. Uh, whether we're talking about a household, whether we're talking about a community, whether we're talking about a church or whoever, you have to have knowledge yourself. You have to understand your body on a very basic level. Um, you know, it's something that you exist in 24 hours a day, uh, 365 days out of the year for the rest of your life. So it stands to reason that you have to know a basic level of uh, information as pertains to your body. And uh, this is all wrapped up under the uh, the top, well, the uh, what I call health defense, health defense. OK. So um, before I get into it, make sure you understand that this is grown folks talk. I assume that everybody who is uh, watching this video is willing to actually do the work. Um, I don't bring this information to uh, to scare you. Like I'm going to show you the medical in institution does purposely, um, largely the, the pharmaceutical industries. I want to, you know, so that's not what I'm here to do. I'm here to give you the facts and then empower you because I'm not going to make any video talking about a problem without actually giving you my idea of what I consider to be the actual solution. You dig? Like, I don't do that whole crying and complaining. Like, our complaints over here is actually our creation. So if we create something, it came out of a, a complaint or issue or whatever, you know? So um, let's go. Let's get let's get ready to start this thing. Uh, make sure y'all subscribe to flynewbeingqueen.com. Uh, also check out flynewbeingkingtv.com, um, which is our growing network for men. Uh, take a time out right now to like this video, like the video, hit the like button. Everybody in the chat, hit the like button. Please share this video. Make sure you share this video. Um, make sure you uh, like the video, share the video, and um, let's go ahead and get into it. All right. Grab your pen, grab your paper, and um, let's get ready to start this thing. All right. So <clears throat> I always start off with a quote. I've used this quote before. I'm going to use it again, and it's because it's it's true. And uh, this is a quote by uh, one of my heroes, Marcus Garvey. It's very simple, very short, to the point. The whole world is run on a bluff. The whole world is run on a bluff. Uh, many of these things that we're uh, that we're, we're looking at, or many of these issues that we're looking at as pertains to uh, health, uh, there's really not much uh, substantial evidence for the treatment of it with medications, or that medications actually uh, help improve your health uh, if you're taking the medications and that's what we're going to be going through um <clears throat> most of this can be considered to just be marketing as far as our ideas and what we know about high blood pressure diabetes cholesterol and all these things uh most of the information that you know about it is solely based off of marketing marketing and sales the inf your health information is coming from a marketer your health information is coming from uh, pharmaceutical industries for the most part it's not truly being developed by true practitioners people the actual doctors the actual nurse practitioners the actual pas that are on the groundwork and they on the ground and actually see things differently they actually are looking at the body and understand that the only reason why uh this is happening is because that is happening so if we get this to stop then this will go away without any medicine and then when they come up with those ideas you get solace you get pushed to the side you get marginalized you get ostracized until you get right then we'll bring you back into the system but as long as you're talking that crazy talk we got to push you out and so that's what we see happening a lot and so largely we're being sold a dream while having our fears monetized because who wants to have a stroke who wants to deal with uh, kidney failure who wants to have a heart attack nobody and they all know that you we fear that we fear that and so uh, there's a lot of fear mongering going on when it comes to these quote unquote diseases. So what I'm talking, the topics that I'm talking about today is going to specifically deal with uh, what we call high blood pressure, uh, type two diabetes, uh, high cholesterol. Specifically, I'm talking about those. So when I'm saying things like medications don't work and X, Y, Z, I'm specifically talking, talking about that. Now it does pertain to other areas, but my area of expertise is going to be high blood pressure, uh, you know, heart disease in general, um, 
cholesterol, diabetes, insulin resistance, okay? So um, <clears throat> I need everybody to go ahead and write down the term or keep in your memory bank three terms, diagnosis creep, overdiagnosis, and disease mongering, okay? Because I need for you all to make sure that you continue this conversation with yourself, your family, and uh, your community in, in general, okay? So write down those terms and keep it with you, okay? Um, next, <clears throat> let's talk about what those actual terms mean. So when we're talking about diagnosis creep, uh, this is the process of broadening definitions that can be described uh, as diagnosis creep. Um, pretty So pretty much if we at one point said that a blood pressure of 190 over 110 is extremely dangerous and medications will actually uh, decrease mortality and morbidity. And we know this to be a fact because we have studies from 1967 uh, with the v the veterans from the VA affair, a hospital uh, showing that people were actually saved by utilizing medications. What diagnosis creep is saying is that, all right, true, we see that, we see that medications are actually helping improve people's life, okay? So this is where we actually see that medications are effective as it pertains to decreasing mortality and morbidity. Diagnosis creep would be, all right, so 180 over 110, medications work. Let's start them earlier. How about uh, 150 over 90? And then next thing you know, how about uh, 130 over 90? Next thing you know, how about 120 over 80? So the problem is disease, diagnosis creep. So pretty much what you're seeing is you're seeing the creeping of the actual requirements to be sick, moving closer and closer to everybody. So at something that was actually effective at one time when treated with a medication, that definition now expands in a way that it may not be helpful, it may not be effective, and in fact, it may actually cause more harm than it does good. And that is the fact, or that is the case, specifically when talking about high blood pressure. I came into this whole thing talking about high blood pressure. When I started, when I opened up my business in, uh, back in 2014, Health Finding Necessary, I was the crazy one running around talking about high blood pressure is not a disease. And it took me a lot of work to actually come to that conclusion. And I continue to say that, and I continue to make courses and write books and talk about high blood pressure over and over and over, even though I, I felt the same way about diabetes and cholesterol. The reason why I stuck with high blood pressure is because one, it's something that we all know. It's something we we all know somebody who has high blood pressure. Uh, two, because that is the tip of the iceberg. And if you understand high blood pressure, then everything else falls in line. If you understand high blood pressure and what is considered to be diagnosis creep or overdiagnosis, then everything else will fall in line. Okay. So um, what I also want to do is read you a uh, a quick a quick part of a uh, article. So this is a medical article. I want y'all to go ahead. Well, take notes. Okay, take notes. You don't have to go right now, but make sure that when you leave this video that you check this out. Uh, once again, this is not medical advice. This is uh, this information is solely for the purpose of education. Uh, please check with your primary care, your medical doctor, your practitioner uh, before making any changes in your medication or any kind of medical condition that you may have. So um, if you type in selling sickness on Google, um, you should be uh, redirected to a uh, ncbi.com or dot, .gov. And so um, this is an article, this is a medical article written by the BMJ, um, British Medical Journal. So if you think that I'm radical, you think that I'm just crazy and everything like that, all right, here go some folks for you that are actually scholarly and is presenting a different way if you want to read that, okay? So essentially what they're saying is that there's a lot of money to be made from telling healthy people that they're sick. Some forms of misleading, uh, so I'm sorry, uh, some forms of medicalizing ordinary life may now be better described as disease mongering. Widening boundaries of treatable illness in order to expand markets for those who sell and deliver treatments. Pharmaceutical companies are actively involved in sponsoring the definition of diseases and promoting them to both prescribers and consumers. All right, so that's the problem, right? That's the problem. So we're talking about a disease, right? Let's take high blood pressure. 
actual practitioners who have their their hands in the actual work who has their foot on the actual grounds who actually care about the patients love the patients uh love this art they call medicine are making recommendations for what is considered to be healthy they're making recommendations for what is what should be treated with medications and what should not be treated for medications because on a clinical level in the actual when you're actually on the ground you don't see uh, improvements when you treat people for medications for a certain certain criteria so you have the people who are doing the work actually making their recommendations and it makes sense that those people would actually make their recommendations because they are the practitioners right they actually went to school for this stuff right so what happens is like we said back in 1967 like 1967 uh this is an actual real study um with uh, high blood pressure in veterans and um you know this is where they actually show that high blood pressure medications were actually effective in veterans who had a diastolic higher than 118. yeah 118 like you had you had multiple uh veterans who actually had higher diastolic numbers um systolic really didn't play a big role because uh back then they understood they they had a better understanding of what was going on with high blood pressure they understood that blood pressure was was essential uh, it was essential that the blood pressure, your body would work that hard to continue to perfuse the 37 trillion cells that you have. And so um, in 1967, with the uh, the veteran veteran affairs study, uh, that's when they saw that medications uh, given to someone who has a diastolic number, a bottom number of 118 or higher, actually improve or decrease mortality and morbidity. But outside of that, they did they weren't seeing any actual improvements. And so what happened is you start getting pharmaceutical industries who have met, who have chemicals that can alter the physiology and grant you a certain metric. So if you have a chemical that can block a beta receptor, which will decrease the contractility of your heart, boom, we got a market. If you have a medication that would act on your pancreas to make it secrete more insulin, boom, we got a we got a medic we got a medication. Now we just have to create some type of disease. Now we have to actually find an audience to sell it to. But what if it's not a problem? And it doesn't matter if it's not a problem. We have chemicals that can alter the physiology. We now need to link this up to a disease. So if we don't have an audience, create an audience. That's what this, that, that's what this article was saying. That's what this article was saying. And so um, <clears throat> it's talking about the social construct of in, uh, illness the social construct of illness is being replaced by the corporate construct of disease. And so at one point, medical practitioners actually took care of these things. They actually took care of these things. They actually decided uh, what was going to happen. But that is being pushed out. And now your new doctor is somebody with a business suit on briefcase that has no idea about medications in your body and anatomy and physiology. All they know is about uh, the actual investors and making sure we increase their return on investment. Medi medicine for large part is really going to that level, really going to that point. So um, please make sure you uh, write down the topic of the, the title of this article um, and you'll be able to read yourself and actually look at the citations and see uh, what it is I'm talking about. <clears throat> and a lot of the reason why um, when you when you read about you know when it says within many disease categories of informal alliances have emerged uh compromising comprising of drug companies staff doctors and consumer groups um ostensibly uh engage in raising public awareness about the underdiagnosed and undertreated problem these alliances tend to promote a view that their particular condition is widespread serious and treatable because these disease awareness campaigns are commonly linked to companies' marketing strategies, they operate to expand markets for new pharmaceutical products. Alternative approach, emphasizing the self-limiting or relatively benign natural history of a problem or the importance of personal uh, coping strategies are downplayed or ignored. Yo, read this article, read this article. I mean, it's straight up giving you the game. And when you look on the side, you see more games. But what happens is when these articles are released, they get bodied immediately, immediately. And they won't they won't see the light of day. Uh, but these are people who are actually on the ground seeing that, yo, I'm giving medications to patients who aren't benefiting from them. I'm trying to convince patients who have a blood pressure of 140 over 85 and they're feeling fine. They're not feeling any symptoms. 
I'm convincing them to continue taking the medication that is making them lightheaded, that makes them dizzy when they stand up, that's giving them a dry chronic cough, that's causing uh, erectile dysfunction. And I'm convincing them that I know you didn't feel a problem before and the medication I gave you is now making you feel a problem. But trust me, you want to continue to take it. And so that's a hard that's a hard pill to literally swallow. And that's a hard sale to have to actually make. And that's what's going on. So uh, this article, like I said, is called Selling Sickness. Uh, you can also look up an article called Disease Mongering. Um, and this, once again, is about how you can expand the market of a quote unquote disease and how to actually uh, utilize people's fear about a quote unquote disease and the outcome against them in order to actually sell them medications. Now, the next problem is going to be people are going to be like, well, all right, I get it. Uh, you're giving medications to people. Uh, who may not really uh, benefit from them, but if they continue to take it, maybe they won't actually ever have that problem. Um, it's not hurting them. And if it, if that was the case, then maybe I wouldn't make such a big deal out of it, right? If the medications actually didn't hurt them, then, you know, if it was benign, if it truly was benign, then maybe it wouldn't be such a big deal. Uh, but these medications are not benign. Matter of fact, there is no benign medication because like I said, the, re the, way, chem the way medications work they work by chemically altering the physiology of your body, all right? That's how they work. And so there will be no benign medication because there's always gonna be a side effect. Um, now what I want us to turn to, I sound like a pastor, right? It's what I want us to turn to. All right, so that's diagnosis creep, that's overdiagnosis, uh, that's disease mongering. Now let's figure out what an actual disease is. What is a disease? Because it actually has a definition. And most of these things that I'm bashing they don't like they don't actually meet the criteria for a disease so let's read the medical definition of a disease a disease is a disorder of structure or function in a human animal or plant especially one that produces specific signs or symptoms or that affect a specific location and it's not simply direct uh it's not simply a direct result of physical injury the word disorder is extremely important in this definition now I'm not going to nitpick, but we need to define disorder. We need to make sure we at least have a working understanding of the word disorder. Uh, disorder means that it is operating out of this natural order, right? So if your body is supposed to respond to a certain, uh, so if, I, if you cut your arm and that thing starts to bleed and it continues to bleed for two weeks, bleeding, 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 bleeding. That's a disorder because it's supposed to actually form a clot. You're supposed to have increasing leukocytes and white blood cells. Uh, it's supposed to scab up. It's supposed to heal itself. That's what's supposed to happen. However, if your body doesn't respond that way based on normal physiology, then that's a disorder. That's a disorder of an actual system in your body. So when we look at something like high blood pressure, where you have uh, the vein, the actual arteries constricting, you have the actual uh, heart contracting uh, harder. Uh, we have to ask, is that really a disorder or is your body making an intelligent move? Is your body adapting to a certain type of an environment that is demanding that we increase the blood flow in order to refuse the 37 trillion cells? When we look at something like uh, diabetes and quote unquote insulin resistance, we have to ask the intelligent question, is the body doing this on purpose? Is the body downregulating the insulin receptors for the purpose of keeping out glucose because your cells are actually at full capacity as pertains to glucose. And if you bring in more glucose, when we don't need more glucose, you're gonna accelerate the death process overnight. And so we have to ask, is the body dumb or is the body intelligent? Is my body just randomly making these uh, mistakes or is it intelligent? Did my body really go through nine months of gestation, the whole mitosis and the splitting of the cells and uh, coming through and understanding how to just uh, breastfeed and how to have those uh, moral reflexes where you splash water in the baby's face and they hold their breath and they put their arms out. And now you get to the point where your body's just like dumb. It has no idea what to do. Well, that's what most of these people would love for you to believe, that your body is just malfunctioning for no reason. However, we're going to switch the actual uh, paradigm from asking what to do to get my blood pressure down, what to do to get my uh, blood sugar down, what to do to get my cholesterol down. We're going to change that paradigm from asking what to do about it to now asking the question of what is it responding to? Because these are adaptive mechanisms. Your body are actually responding to a certain environment. And so these things that we're calling diseases are not disorders. 
Uh, what do you want your body to do? You have 60,000 miles of blood vessels, 60,000 miles of blood vessels. You have 37 trillion cells at least. If those cells don't get the oxygen and nutrients that they need, they die, right? And then you die, right? So if you have a blockage in your artery and a blood pressure of 120 over 80, it's not sufficient enough to continue the blood flow. What do you want your body to do? What you, what you want your body to do? Just tap out, decrease the blood pressure and let you die? No, it's not going to do that. It's going to increase the actual blood pressure. Why? Because it needs to get the blood to those cells by any means necessary. And so your body is actually adapting to the stress in that internal environment. Blood High blood pressure is not a disease. It is an actual sign. It is actually a, a symptom of what's going on inside your actual cardiovascular system. It is letting you know that there is a blockage. There is stiffening of the artery. The, the blood is actually too uh, thick, increasing viscosity. And so since the environment denotes that I respond in a certain way in order for us to survive, that's what I'm going to do. So that's the definition of a disease. <clears throat> and many of these things that we're treating with medications uh, don't actually line up with the, uh, the the definition of disease. All right. So let's take a quick break. Yo, y'all go ahead, subscribe to flynubianqueen.com. Uh, uh, make sure you uh, check out our new platform called flynubiankingtv.com as well, too. Uh, text the word queens to 31996. Um, also, hit the like button. Everybody in the chat right now, do me a favor, hit the like button, hit the like button, hit the like button. Yo, save this video if you can. Save it if you can. Um, but also, should share it. Share the video. Uh, push the video around. Um, our people need to know this information because it's about to get a little deeper now. All right. So um, once again, my name is Edward Williams. I'm the founder and creative health by any necessary. Uh, you can find me on social media at at health bam uh, health bam B A M N. That stands for by any necessary. Um, you can also check out my website uh, hbam.com h b m. I'm sorry h b a m n dot com. All right. Let's keep going. <clears throat> All right, so I'm gonna go over one more definition and then we're gonna really get into what I came here to discuss with y'all tonight or to, to today. All right, so we talked about a disease. We talked about how it's a disorder of the actual structure and function in human or animal plant. Let's talk about a risk factor because what's happening, is there a, a subtle switch from something that's a risk factor to getting you to call it a disease? They won't call it a disease, like on books, in actual text, black and white, it's not listed as a disease. It's listed as risk factors. Um, however, they allow other people to call it a disease because that's where the money starts to come in. So a risk factor. In epidemiology, a risk factor is a variable associated with an increased risk of disease or infection. Uh, risk factors are risk factors or determinants are correlational and not necessarily causal because correlation does not prove causation. And I think that's something that uh, Johnny Cochran said. Um, correlation does not equal causation. Epidemiologists often use the term risk factor to indicate a factor that is associated with a given outcome. However, a risk factor is not necessarily a cause. So what does this mean? So this means that let's, let's just talk about um, uh, a fire. Like let's say you have for the past couple of days, there's been fires in the neighborhood, right? Houses have been burning down. Somebody's going around and they're actually uh, causing fires in the neighborhood. And the police arriving on the stage on, on the scene of the crime, the police are riding, arriving on the scene of the crime. And every time they get to the scene of the crime, they're like, hmm, house on fire. What's these people over here doing? This big red truck with all this fluid coming out of it. What are they doing? Huh, you know, they were there at the last fire and the fire before. That's interesting. And then another fire happens and then they get to the scene. And then, yo, there goes that, that big truck with the word fire on it. <laughs> That with the word fire truck on it and it's pouring out all this fluid i got it that fire truck is causing the fire because every time we show up on the scene the fire truck is on the actual scene of the crime therefore the fire truck is causing the actual fires we solved the case lock them up and throw them away and so you lock them up you throw them away and then what happens the fire keeps going but now the fire is worse because there's nobody to actually stop the fire until you actually hear somebody say hey um those were firefighters. They were actually fighting the truck. Uh, they were actually fighting the fire. Um, the reason why they're on the scene of the crime is because they have a function and they're not the enemy. These people are convincing you that you are actually producing enemies in your body willy nilly. Good cholesterol, bad cholesterol. Where they do that at? That's a me medical fairy tale. 
There's no such thing. Your body creates cholesterol. There's no good cholesterol or bad cholesterol. Uh, high blood pressure. Your body's just doing it for no reason. Right? That's what they will tell you. Oh, it runs in your family. It's genetic. Your mom gave it to you. Your dad gave it to you. It runs in your family. Oh, and plus, yo, you're black. So what you expect? you black. You're going to get sick. Right? That's the narrative that we are subtly given on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about risk factor. Just because something is on the scene of the crime doesn't necessarily mean that it is the cause for it. All right. So um, it's very important that we uh, we be more responsible as practitioners. So if you're a practitioner here, it's very important that we as practitioners uh, be, become very uh, responsible with the, the term disease, because once again, disease has a term. And when you label somebody as having a disease, that's not a benign move. That's not a benign move because like I said, the disease, the, the, the term disease actually has a definition and the, the, the conditions that I'm talking about don't even meet that criteria. So we're talking about high blood pressure. Um, you got to understand that this matters because uh, research shows that being diagnosed with a chronic disease, when you tell a person that they have a disease, it can cause a person a great deal of distress because it's going to put them on an emotional roller coaster. When someone is informed that they have a disease, it's automatically going to be associated with death. So you're automatically going to tell this person that they have a disease. They're automatically going to think about the dying. And this is going to put them in an emotional roller coaster because uh, from this from this association of early death, they will now make moves based on fear. So, uh, you know, I call this white coat magic when you come into the cold office and the temperatures decrease, which uh, lowers your confidence. Um, and then you have the actual screen playing with this lady running in the flowers and it's an actual medic. It's a medication commercial about some kind of depression medicine. And so you're being suggested Then you got all these plaques in the wall uh, about degrees and associations and about, you know, big awards. And so your confidence is being lowered even more. And now you see that more people, these outside people know more than you. And then you have to go in the actual room, sit on this table that rattles with all this paper on it. Everything's cold. And then the white coat walks in and you're open. You're open. It's, it's called white coat magic. Um, it's a term that I made up, um, but the actual real term is called uh, medical hexing. You can look that up. And so uh, this is where you're just open to suggestions because you're scared. You're scared. You have no idea what this means. Um, you have no idea why your body's responding to that. And so you're really open to all suggestions. And this can set the stages for you to be abused without even knowing. Because your life and health is largely dependent on this practitioner and their knowledge and their morals. That's not a good position to be in. This is why we talk about self-care every single day. When I'm on this platform, I'm talking about self-care. I'm talking about being your own primary care provider. I'm talking about health defense, because if you don't know uh, how these things work and not in a deep level, but just on the basic levels, then you're opening yourself up to all these issues. And so once again, I said that this is a problem because uh, being told that you have a disease when you don't have a disease uh, actually does more harm than it does good. Um, you know, people are going to waste valuable time while misunderstanding the purpose of black blood pressure. And so um, now here we go. I'm about to pull out the uh, the trump card. Right. Because people may be like, yo, get to the point. What, what are you getting at? What are you getting at? Well, what I'm getting at is that these medications don't work. And I'm telling you all this because I love you all. I'm telling y'all this because y'all my people. Uh, we live in the same community. Uh, mom, dad, uncle, cousins, grandma, uh, grandpa. We got to know the truth. Th I'm not here to try to scare you. I'm here to empower you because if you understand that the medications you are taking don't work as it pertains to decreasing your mortality and morbidity, and you're taking them thinking that you're safe, and you're just allowing the lifestyle part to continue to go the way that it's going to work, you're going to get the same results that everybody else is going to get that rather they take it or they don't take it. If the lifestyle part doesn't change, everything else is going to stay the same. This means that the rate of uh, hospitalization, the rate of death, the rate of strokes, heart attack, uh, kidney failure, uh, ending up on dialysis, uh, amputations, erectile dysfunction, so forth and so on. If you don't actually change, see, the only thing that works is changing the lifestyle, improving the lifestyle. That's the only thing that has been shown time after time after time after time to actually work. Medications, on the other hand, when we're talking about these chronic conditions, when we're talking about these actual uh, uh, high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, cholesterol, medication has not been shown to be effective. Now, I know people don't believe me and um, it, I just sound radical. So what I need you all to do, uh, people who rock with me, you already know what I'm about to tell you all. 
type in the NNT. The NNT. The NNT. Uh, Nancy, Nancy, trouble. <laughs> type in the NNT and make sure y'all write these things down, please. And uh, like I said, share this video, subscribe to it. All right. So if you're on the NNT already, <clears throat> please go ahead and um, click on the uh, part at the top that says uh, reviews. And then you're going to click on therapy NNT. Now, I'm going to be very brief with this because I've done multiple videos on the NNT. I've done multiple videos on why these medications don't grant you the result. Um, and this is where the disconnect becomes. This is where I get the actual disconnect with um, not only my medical colleagues and my actual, the people I'm, I'm trying to help. The reason why we get the disconnect is because essentially we're speaking different languages. And this reminds me of a, a story I heard, you know, they call them slave narratives. Uh, but this reminds me of a story I, uh, I read about um, people uh, back back when our ancestors were actually in, were enslaved. Um, you would have people who look like each other, look exactly like each other, came from the same country, and could not communicate with each other because the the new brother sister uh, that was just stolen from their land and brought and forced over to this land spoke the indigenous language, and then he's looking at his brother or sister who has been colonized, who has been enslaved and has been here for multiple years, who now speaks uh, English, is trying to communicate with his brother or sister, even though they look alike, come from the same continent, come from the same country, they can't communicate. They can't communicate. He has, she has no idea what he's saying. No, not, no idea. And he can mean, the like, he's trying to, like, give her the game, you know, really empower her, tell her, you know, what we got to do. She can't understand anything. It looks just like him. And most likely it's related to them. Can't can't understand them. And so because we've been conditioned and we have been marketed to, heavily marketed to uh, by the pharmaceutical industries and not by the actual practitioners, I fully believe that this thing would look very different if we were getting the information from the actual people on the ground, the actual practitioners who have a heart, who have a soul, who have morals and ethics. But it doesn't work like that. So uh, let's go to NNT. So when we look at the NNT, if you look at where it says uh, antihypertensive for cardiovascular pre prevention and mild hy hypertension, um, what you're going to see is that <clears throat> they're telling you when we look at the number needed to treat. So NNT stands for number number needed to treat. This means how many people do we have to give this medication to for a certain amount of time before we actually see them being saved from uh, death, stroke, heart disease, or any type of cardiovascular event? How many people do we need to actually treat? And um, once again, the name Cochrane pops up again because uh, Cochrane is usually, uh, they're like the, the, the hating, they're like the haters in the pharmaceutical industry because they come behind and do independent research. And it was like, you know, uh, yeah, so this whole study and this whole industry, this billion dollar industry that you created is built off of bullshit. And none of this stuff actually uh, works. It doesn't matter. And we've done studies on it and we came out to this conclusion. So when you look at this study right here, it's talking about antihypertensive uh, treatment for the primary prevention of cardiovascular events and mild hypertension. When we're talking about mild hypertension, once again, we're speaking different languages because if you go look at what mild hypertension is defined as today that is different than what it was in 2012. so what i mean is that this study that cochran did was back in 2012 okay this is when mild hypertension was defined essentially as anything systolic number under 160 and the bottom number under i'm sorry 159 and the bottom number under 99. so there this study is all about medications being given to anybody who has mild it's called mild hypertension back in 2012. if you're giving medications to people who have mild hypertension a blood pressure essentially 160 systolic number and 99 bottom number if you're giving medication to the people we show that it doesn't help anybody you can give the medications as long as you want it doesn't help anybody it doesn't prevent strokes it doesn't prevent deaths it doesn't prevent heart attack it doesn't prevent cardiovascular issues However, one in 12 of these people will be harmed by the medications and they will have side effects and they will have to actually stop the drug. That's what this study is saying, right? And so now, once again, I told you about the disconnect in, in the actual uh, language because I'm saying mild hypertension. Mild hypertension is something different today. And this is, <laughs> this is, the, very, this is very, the very interesting part about it that will make you go through a mild psychosis. If you don't really peep game and understand that, yo, 
this is the street game. Like this is the street game all over again. Like we think that they're thugs. We think that uh, these are gangsters. No, no. The gangsters and thugs look very different. And you have to you have to really switch that the way you look at them. So the reason why, so right now, if we were to look up uh, what mild, mild hypertension is, um, based on the newest guidelines, which we got to talk about that, that's a whole different conversation. If we look at what mild hypertension is considered to be today, mild hypertension is considered to be, I'm sorry, if we look at the mild hypertension of 2012, which is anything below top number 160 and bottom number uh, 99, anything at that range and low is considered mild hypertension. Well, that blood pressure reading today puts you at a stage two hypertension. This means that you're in big trouble. If you got a blood pressure, like if you did a time travel and you were sick, I mean, you were healthy back in 2012 and we traveled you up to uh, 2017, I'm sorry, 2019, you will be sick. And that's what happened. So that pl blood pressure back in 2012 is now considered not only to be bad, but bad, bad. Like it's stage two, not stage one, not elevated, not pre, stage two, my friend. So not only are you sick, but you sick, sick. So how did this happen? How does this happen? I'm going I'm I'm to break it down real easy about how it happened. Essentially, the way it happened is that I got a goal post, right? I'm saying, hey, kick the ball. Boom. And you kick it. You knock it out of the park. You, you score. You kick it again. Boom. All right, good. And I'm like, this guy's pretty good. Squirrel. You're like, what? And I'm like, and I back off. I'm like, yo, I don't know. Maybe it was uh, maybe it was win. I don't know what it was. Kick the ball again. And you're like, I just kicked it, man. I just knocked out the park, bro. And you're like, no, nah, no, nah, kick it again. And you kick it. Ooh, kick it again. Ooh, what happened to your foot? You have foot fatigue. We need to treat you for that. So essentially, the goalposts move, the requirements move. And that wouldn't be a problem if it was being done for a reason. That would actually improve people's health however that's not the case and if you google the topic or you google uh it's at slate.com most people who take blood pressure medication possibly shouldn't right uh this is an article that was written back in 2012 like i said you only these articles are old um they get bodied as soon as they come out because they don't play well with the uh, pharmaceutical industries and so uh, essentially what this study goes through and it, it outlines what the cochran study was already saying um, and it just proves that, you know, most people taking blood pressure medications, just they don't they don't they shouldn't take it and they don't benefit from it. Um, <clears throat> and so that's the moving goalpost. And I witnessed this happen overnight. Right. Um, back in 2017. So on the low, I'm a medical nerd. Right. Like on the low, I'm the person who gets alert about any anything that's popping off in the world of heart disease, blood pressure, uh, diabetes. I get an alert on my phone. New article just came out. New study just came out because I'm doing this for my people. I need to see what's going on before it even happens. And so uh, back in uh, November 2017, I got one. Right. And so for years and years and years and years, something called JNC, which stands for Joint National Committee, was always in charge of dictating what the blood pressure uh, guidelines were. Right. They were always in charge of it. Uh, so you have you have something called from JNC one all the way up to JNC eight. You have JNC six, JNC seven, um, and so JNC six and seven. You know they're pretty much you know uh, everybody's familiar with that. You know um, let me see, let me pull up real quick. Um, so essentially, you know uh, they're pretty much saying that a blood pressure that is normal is considered to be one twenty uh, over eighty. That's considered to be normal, and then JNC seven now took that normal, and they said, well, that's no longer normal. Uh, we're considering that to be prehypertension. So JNC seven uh, was the corridor. It was the first time. Uh, that we ever saw this thing called pre-disease. So JNC7 introduced pre-hypertension, and this was the first time we saw pre-disease. And from pre-disease, you get pre-diabetes. And so you start getting all these pre-sick. So it was like, you're not sick yet, but you're about to be sick. Like, you're not sick, but you're finna be sick. And so since you're finna be sick, let's go ahead and treat that sickness. And so in 2012, I'm sorry, 20, no, 2017, um, I got an alert on my phone in November. And essentially, the uh the guidelines for blood pressure had changed now we talked about jnc6 and we talked about jnc7 jnc7 actually introduced prehypertension right well they must have had a lapse 
in their memory or, or something happened. Some some radical person must have took over the JNC uh, JNC committee uh, because the JNC eight was the only JNC that actually showed they were using actual uh, uh, data. They actually did studies. There's like, yo, who's going to benefit from taking medications? I don't want to know about, you know, how low it's going to take the uh, blood pressure. I want to know who's going to benefit from it. So the JNC eight came to this conclusion and they said, yo, straight up, this is what we have. If you're 60 or older, then we want to see your blood pressure 150 over 90 or less. We don't have any evidence that treating your blood pressure um, down to 120 or 110 will benefit you. In fact, we have evidence that means that if we get your blood pressure that low with a medication, it'll actually cause you more harm than good. And they said for everybody else who's 60, who's younger than 60, um, your blood pressure, yo, just keep it 140 over 90. Keep it that number or below because we don't have any evidence that points to us treating you uh, with medications that will actually improve your health. Matter of fact, if we treat you with these medications, uh, we're just gonna make things worse. So that's what the JNC said, and people were big mad. They had a huge problem with that. Um, then you had the rebels of the medical community that were like, yeah, all right, cool, about time, about time. And then what happened? In November, 2017, I get this alert. <clears throat> JNC8 got bodied. It got assassinated. It got taken out. JNC8, the JNC uh, Joint National Committee was no longer in charge of actually dictating blood pressure. They got pushed up out of the paint. And now the people who took over of the actual blood pressure guidelines uh, with the American Heart Association and the American Stroke Association. And people will be like, yeah, that makes sense. You know, Heart, Heart Association and Stroke Association. So what they said is that um, if your blood pressure is above 120, over 80, you have high blood pressure. You have high blood pressure. All that talk they did the year previous about you being healthy and not needing to take medications, your blood pressure is at 130 over uh, 89. You need medications. And so uh, what happened now, they did they did the study and they were like, yo, we want to see the results of this. And that's when we find that, that nobody's benefiting from it. it actually caused more harm than good. Um, but I guess that doesn't matter because it's still being pushed. So since it's still being pushed, people are still uh, having issues with uh, the medications. And then this is why when you look at the number needed to treat, you don't see any benefits because the benefits never came to people who had mild hypertension. The benefits never came to people who had uh, mild conditions. The benefits of medication only works in extreme situations. This is why you'll see uh, medication helping people out who actually already had a, uh, a, a actual event, a cardiovascular event. The only thing that actually benefits and that actually works is the improvement in lifestyle. And so you can go back on this, uh, the NNT.com, and you can keep on looking, right? You can look at cholesterol. That one is just sick. When you look at heart disease, uh, statin for the actual prevention of uh, heart disease, not only will people not benefit from it, but people are actually, you're going to get people, one, one in 50 uh, people are actually going to develop diabetes. Yes, these statin medications can actually cause diabetes. Uh, one in 10 people are actually going to have uh, muscle damage, uh, rhabdomyolysis, because one of the ways that this medicine, statin medications work is by inhibiting the actual enzyme that creates cholesterol. Uh, lo and behold, you actually need cholesterol. So when you start messing around with the body and what it's naturally doing, you're going to have what the, the uh, medical community calls side effects. So and if you keep on going down and going on, you look at how uh, the number need to treat for those who are taking uh, anti-diabetic medications or even insulin, you're gonna see a common theme. It doesn't work, it doesn't work. So, and let me say this, you know, cause uh, people gonna be like, yeah, I take medication and it lowers my blood pressure. All right, so yeah, it works as far as the metric part goes. I don't disagree that if you take a beta blocker or a statin or a anti-diabetic medication, I agree that beta blocker will block that receptor which will cause your heart to decrease uh, the contractility, uh, the ACE inhibitor may actually cause vasodilation. I agree. And that's going to result in a lower blood pressure. I agree. I don't disagree that a soft on urea such as glimepirazide will actually uh, increase the actual secretion of insulin from your pancreas. I agree. I agree that metformin will actually decrease the absorption of glucose. I agree. I agree that the statin medication, simvastatin, Lipitor, all these medications actually inhibit the enzyme in the liver that creates uh, cholesterol. I agree. On a metric level, yeah, they're effective as far as decreasing the metrics. My question is, 
how effective are they when it comes to decreasing mortality and morbidity? Because that's why you're taking the medication. You're taking the medication because you don't want to die from a heart attack, a stroke, uh, any kind of cardiovascular event, kidney problems, kidney disease. That's why you're taking the medication. So what we need to know, what we need to ask is how do they work on that part? The actual important part, the reason why I'm actually taking the medication. Yo, these medications will actually cause you the big event that you're trying to run from, such as a statin medication or the blood pressure medication that actually increases the chances of having a stroke. They work the opposite. So while we're taking chemicals to physically to chemically alter the actual physiology of the body, we need to understand that your body is doing these, it's making these adaptions on purpose. Your body is actually doing these things on purpose. And so somebody's going to ask the question, are you saying that having high blood pressure is healthy? Are you saying that having high cholesterol is healthy? Are you saying that having a high blood sugar is healthy? I need for us to step out of this Western philosophy of good, bad, uh, healthy, unhealthy, and ask the question of what is appropriate. Because what I'm telling you is that it's appropriate. If you don't, if you're not taking any medications and your blood pressure is 150 over 90, that is an appropriate response given the environment. If you have stiff arteries, what do you want your body to do? It's responding appropriately. An inappropriate response would be to actually not adapt. That would be a disorder, right? Yo, y'all talk to me. Come on, let me let me make sure I'm not talking to myself. If you have a stiff artery, if you have a blockage in your artery, you got 60,000 miles of blood vessels. We're talking about 60,000 miles. This means that it can wrap around planet Earth 2.5 times because the radius of planet Earth, I'm sorry, the circumference of planet Earth is 25,000 miles. And so your your vessels, your blood vessels can wrap around planet Earth 2.5 times. So in the event that something goes wrong, such as a stiffened artery, uh, such as actual blockage, uh, such as actual clot, or maybe you have thick uh, blood, you have a decrease or increase in viscosity, um, should your body have the ability to actually adapt and overcome these adversities? Wouldn't that make sense? Wouldn't that be the appropriate response? If you have a blockage and you have 37 trillion cells and your body needs to get the blood to perfuse those 37 trillion cells, wouldn't you like your body to have the ability to adapt? Right. And so that would be the actual proper uh, appropriate response. However, a disordered response, a disordered response would be to, it's like a disordered response to uh, somebody running up on your family and putting their work on your family right in front of them. A disordered response would be to call the cops. A disordered response would be to, hey, don't hit my son. Hey, don't do that. Or the disordered response would be to world star. Woo! Look at that baby get punched. Woo! That would be a disordered response. You dig? So you bet not do any of those things. The, prop, the appropriate response would be to neutralize the threat. That's the appropriate response, right? So your body has this common sense on a natural level is going to make the appropriate response by increasing the blood pressure, by down regulating the insulin receptors, by increasing the cholesterol because uh, and cholesterol is the precursor for uh, hormone production, uh, tissue repair, um, increasing. Uh, it's an anti-inflammatory. It's actually an antioxidant for your brain. And so lo and behold, these things actually have function in your body. And so when your body activates these troops, it's the appropriate response. Inappropriate response would be to not do anything in the face of adversity. Medications make your body not respond appropriately in the face of medications. Let's go back and look at the definition for disease. A disease is a disorder, a disorder part of the body, the function of the system. This is where the system is not operating appropriately. It's not operating the normal way. So I told you, when your blood pressure increases, it's doing that because of the actual environment. When, you're, when you have insulin resistance, it's doing that because of the environment. When you have high levels of cholesterol, it's doing that because of the environment. It's doing that because your body's actually adapting. It's, your body sees it necessary to actually do these things. Those are, that's the normal order. That's the normal function. If it doesn't do that, if you don't have the ability to actually create cholesterol in the face of need, if you don't have the ability to create a high blood pressure in the face of need, you die. Medications make you operate inappropriately. So 
maybe the case could be made that medications actually create diseases because a disease i'll read the definition for y'all again so y'all can think that you know you know that i'm actually reading it the, so medic uh, so a disease is a disorder of structure or function if the normal function is to actually increase and adapt and a disorder would mean that it would not increase and it would not adapt we now have to find out what would make your body do that and medications will actually make your body not adapt to the environment. So maybe somebody, maybe somebody can make the case for medications actually creating uh, diseases, real diseases. So, um, <clears throat> yo, y'all still with me? Let me check in with you real quick. So welcome to flynewbeingqueen.com. I appreciate y'all for walking with me. Uh, please make sure you uh, subscribe to the channel. Also check out our new platform, flynewbeingkingtv.com, which is our growing network for millionaire men. Uh, be sure to text the word queen to 31996 please y'all share this video share the video share the video uh like the video like the video like the video um also uh check out fly newbie in business if you want to start a business i highly recommend that and also check out fly newbie money if you want to get started with investment uh you know saving your money and everything financial all right so um so essentially what we have high blood pressure is a risk factor right high blood pressure is a risk factor Increasing glucose is actually a risk factor. Increasing uh, cholesterol is actually a risk factor. Yes, they may be on the scene of the crime. That don't mean they actually committed the crime. And so what we have is the medicalization of risk factors. And this is how back in 2017 of November, where you had millions of Americans that went to sleep healthy. They went to sleep healthy. Their blood pressure when they went to sleep was healthy, was fine. And then when they woke up, guess what? When they watched the news, they found out that they were sick. This happened in uh, 2017, November, because uh, the threshold was dramatically lowered. The, trust, the threshold for healthy blood pressure went from being 140 over 90 all the way down to 120 over 80. If you creep one, one micro, if you creep just one bit above that 120, you're sick. You're sick. And so you have people who went to sleep healthy, woke up sick, and what that did was it, the uh, the percentage of people who had high blood pressure went from 31.9 percent of the American population all the way to 45.6 percent of the American population, which means that the pharmaceutical industry now has 31 million people that are potential uh, candidates for their medications. Now, the big problem with all of this is, is that when we look at the actual people who are sitting on these panels to decide what your medic what your blood pressure should be what your blood sugar should be what your cholesterol should be when we look at these panels who's sitting on it it's a freaking joke it is a freaking joke so when we look at who's sitting on the panels hold on real quick let me uh pull something up so when we're talking about high blood pressure and we're looking at uh who's sitting on the panels among the panels that's the close competing interests 75% of the panel members had multiple ties to a median of seven drug companies each. These members were paid uh, by companies for activities like speaking, consulting, advising, or research. And so when we look at the uh, the actual drug panels, the blood pressure guidelines back in 20, 20, 2003, uh, this is when the uh, term prehypertension was actually created. You had 80 members on the panel that created the term prehypertension, which people were now eligible to be treated for, 80% of those members actually had ties to 12 companies each. Eight of the nine members had financial ties. All right. So what does this all mean? This means that you can't really depend on these entities to provide you with true help. Yo, y'all hold on real quick.
<clears throat> all right, so I apologize for that. So what does this all mean? What does this all mean? Uh, this means that it is past time that we start doing for self. It is past time that we become our own primary care providers. It is past time that we have a decent understanding of the body. And it is past time that we be proactive. It's past time that we start being so passive as a community in our health. Now, <clears throat> I did a video the other day called uh, Obesity in the Black Community, or uh, something like that. It's the last video that I did. You can go check it out. And um, a lot of people brought up some topics, you know, uh, some points on uh, social media as far as why it's a problem uh, and why, you know, we can't fix the problem. And um, I get it. Those people didn't watch the videos because every single point they were saying was a problem that truly is a problem. So we're talking about food deserts. That is a that's a that's a huge problem. That's a huge problem. Um, when we talk about, you know, just culture. Yeah, that's a problem. But at the same time, when I go through and actually talk about uh, the solutions to the problem, I can tell that those people didn't watch the videos. So if you are just looking for a way to uh, wriggle out of doing the work or trying to find an excuse, then you're, I'm just I'm just simply not your guy. I'm just simply not your guy. However, if you want, if you're looking for practical and sustainable uh, advice, recommendations, uh, information to actually empower yourself and your family, we can talk it all day. All right, we can talk about it all day. And so for those who've been watching me, you already know where I'm going with this as far as my recommendations, right? You already you already know I'm going with this. So uh, let me go ahead and wrap up the part, the medical part uh, by saying this. We have to ask the question of uh, appropriate versus inappropriate. We also have to learn our bodies. We also have to pay attention to our bodies. We also have to stop relying on outside systems to solely be in control of our health while being so uh, passive in it. We just have to do way better. Um, if we don't, then we're going to leave behind a generation of kids and our grandkids and so forth and so on that will truly believe that this just runs in a family. We have to take action right now today to start to improve our health as a whole, as a community and show the next generation coming up, how you do this. Because if not, everybody's gonna be getting placed on medication at an earlier and earlier age. Diabetes, yo, diabetes in the pediatric ward used to be something that was, um, for the most part, 90% type one diabetes. Now, when you go to pediatric ward and you talk about diabetes, it's 50-50. 50% -50. 50 type one, 50% type two. It's increasing. And, um, we have we just have to we just have to because right now uh, with the rate we're going <clears throat> our kids are going to continue to actually believe our kids and our grandkids are going to continue to believe that yo it runs in our family it runs in our veins so go ahead and treat the baby even though it's just born you know along with everything else that you've given the baby go ahead and give it metformin inside of the similac because you know black people you know black babies they just get sick so go ahead and give it to them right now um and you oh yeah so for those who don't know <laughs> You can look this up real quick. Um, there is a uh, a blood pressure vaccine that's being made. Uh, they have now passed the uh, the second stage. They're trying to get it to be uh, more effective. They're trying to get it to last longer because right now when you get the vaccine for blood pressure, uh, it only lasts six months. They're trying to see if they can stretch that to a whole year. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, you can check that out. If y'all think I'm just over here rambling. All right, so um, we need to understand we talk about appropriate versus inappropriate. Uh, many of the health advice that we have is actually uh, marketing. It's actually medical marketing. Um, these pharmaceutical industries, uh, they heavily influence the actual practitioners. The practitioners really don't understand what's going on, not as a whole, but uh, they truly think that they're helping the patients. A, a, a lot of them, I can't speak for all of them, but a lot of practitioners just believe that they're uh, helping the patients based on the guidelines. And that's the problem. So uh, this isn't about the actual practitioners themselves. You got to understand that the practitioners have to practice protocols and guidelines, and it is within that system of, of uh, protocols and guidelines where it's already baked in. Like it's, it, the bag is already secured within the actual advice. The advice itself already baked in the bag. And so your practitioner can be practicing the protocol the best to their ability. Um, many of these outcomes will still lead to medication, the increase in medication, the increase in medication uh, and insulin. And then the whole the whole entire journey will look the same 
for everybody that it looks like everybody else. So um, <clears throat> how do we deal with this? How do we deal with this? Uh, one, make sure you go back and check out my video I did called uh, Better Medication Versus Better Education. Uh, because in that one, I laid out a five-point uh, quality question uh, plan for you to ask. If you go, if you choose to work inside this, uh, this healthcare system, then I, I hardly uh, recommend that you have these five questions in your back pocket and you actually know the, know the answers to these questions before you go into your medical office. Uh, the first question is, is it preventable? So when we're talking about any condition, this, this, this relates to any condition, you need to ask yourself, so whether it's high blood pressure, cholesterol, is it preventable? Is this something I could have done? Because even though, even if there wasn't something that um, I could have done, you know, if there's, if it's preventable, then I can now teach my, my kids, my family, my, my church, whoever, right? So we need to know, is it preventable or is this something that just really runs in my family? Does it really run in my gene? And if it does run in my gene, what gene is it? If you can't answer that, then I call BS, right? So the next question we need to ask is, is it reversible? So if you have high blood pressure, you need to get an answer. Is Can I reverse it? If I have diabetes, can I reverse it? If I have high cholesterol, can I actually reverse it? You need to know that. Um, next, your, and this usually uh, stops the whole conversation, but uh, do these medications decrease mortality and morbidity? Don't ask the question of, do the medications work? Don't ask the questions of, um, you know, is this a good medication? Don't ask those questions because the game can take place. The, the hustle can take place. So do the medications work? I told you, yeah, they work, man. These things will inhibit that uh, enzyme like no other. It will it will cut off that beta blocker like no other. Like it'll do the job on a chemical level. But once again, your question needs to be, will it decrease mortality and morbidity? Will it decrease death? Will it decrease the, uh, the outside, the other things that I'm trying to stay away from, strokes, heart attack, uh, kidney disease, X, Y, Z. Um, also, if, it, if the medications do decrease mortality and morbidity, you need to now ask, will the side effects outweigh uh, the actual benefits? Will the side effects outweigh the benefits? And then lastly, uh, is there a, a safe and effective alternative? Is there a safe and effective natural alternative? Because if there is, then we need to start with that one first, right? We need to start with that one first, and then let's see what happens with that. So those are five questions I recommend that everybody keeps in their back pocket, right? So um, <clears throat> what are my recommendations? My recommendations are the same recommendations that I essentially uh, make in every single video. So um, my name, oh yeah, so my name is uh, Edward Williams. I'm the owner and founder of Health by Any Means Necessary. So let's talk about the actual recommendations. So the first recommendations is to stop taking a nutritional colonizer. I did a video on nutritional colonizer, essentially nutritional colonizer or processed foods, the standard American diet. Uh, these are foods that have no intentions whatsoever to actually improve your health. I don't care what the box is screaming to you. I don't care what that bag is screaming to you. If your food can brag and talk about, now we made with your real vitamin C. Now we have 10% more, uh, more fiber. That's walk away, all right? Uh, next, we need to eat whole foods. You got to understand that your cells, your body is constantly re rebuilding itself, constantly being, uh, you have 37 trillion cells. You have millions of cells being destroyed and created uh, every single day. What those cells are going to use to actually create itself out of depends on the actual uh, information, the material that you're bringing into it. So uh, remember, your food is not fuel and you're not a car. Your food is information. Every morsel of food that you're taking in your body will now inform your cells whether or not it should increase or decrease information, increase or decrease in, uh, insulin, uh, increase or decrease the actual bacteria in your microbiome, increase or turn on or turn off the actual genes. So we need to make sure that we choose high quality of food uh, and whole foods is going to be that food, especially with the emphasis on leafy greens. Next, we got to move. We have to move. We have to get walking. We have to get, you know, I, this could just be taking some bottles or taking some cans and speed walking up and down your block. You got to move. Whether you uh, set your clock at work every 45 minutes to get up and walk upstairs, walk down the hallway and walk down the hallway, or you do push ups on your desk, we got to be moving every single day. It doesn't have to be anything strenuous. It doesn't have to be anything that incorporates the actual gym. So uh, let the uh, excuse about I don't have a gym membership go. Let that go. Let it go. You can grab a book bag, fill it up with bags, stop swinging around. If you got babies, if you got kids, then you have an actual gym right there. Stop picking them kids up, push them over your head. Don't drop the baby, but use them. You know, like they use you, use them too. All right, make this a mutual, mutual benefit relationship. Um, then you need to make sure you actually drink water. So I recommend dramatically decreasing 
all of the juices, the sodas, uh, especially the beers, because essentially when you're drinking this, you're telling your body, yo, that whole fat loss thing, forget about it. Stop it. Stop it. Because when you're drinking these juices and these sodas, it inhibits lipolysis. Lipolysis is the breakdown of fat in order for your body to use it as energy. And as long as you're taking those in, then you're not going to do that. Okay. So dramatically cut out the juices. Um, I recommend cutting out the in general um, and drink solely water. Water, you, you, most of us are mildly dehydrated. Most of us are mildly dehydrated um, and we need water. When you are dehydrated, once again, I did a video uh, about the horrible health advice that we're getting as a community. I talk about water and why we need it. So go back and check those uh, those videos out. Like I've done about 17, 18 videos so far on Fly Nubian Queens, uh, Fly Nubian King. You utilize those videos. Utilize those videos because I'm giving you practical information, sustainable information that you'll be able to carry on for the rest of your life. Like this is not a fad. I'm not giving you information that you have to actually pull out the credit card and buy stuff. I'm not telling you to count no calories. I'm not telling you to weigh no foods. I'm not telling you to pee on no stick and check your ketones. I'm not telling you to check to see if the chicken breast is the side of your hands. That's not living. That's not living. That's not natural. I'm giving you practical and sustainable advice. And most of the advice I'm giving you, it don't cost any money. Uh, next thing I want you to do is you got to get onto the sun. So vitamin D is not a vitamin. It's a hormone. In my last video, two videos ago, I, I did that. I talked about the health, the, the health device, right? Please go check out that video. Uh, but vitamin D is actually a hormone and uh, we need it when you, when we have low uh, vitamin D or hormone D, we're extremely vulnerable to every single thing out there. Um, also make sure you wrap up all this advice inside of a community. So whether you work with a community, whether you live in a community, but get out and about and actually do this with your community or with your family or people who have like-minded. And then lastly, my strongest recommendation, the recommendation that I know would change the health conditions of our community overnight is fasting. Fasting is everything. Fasting is my gospel. We eat entirely too much and the foods that we're eating is horrible. We know it. Come on, let's keep it real. We know it. We don't, we don't have, we don't have room to be cute about this. We don't have room. I know, I know we have a culture and, you know, we swag it out. You know, we talk about it. We laugh about it. We, we do all those things. Um, but listen, like I said, we can laugh. We can hee hee and we can cock, we can kiki -ki and do all those things. Like my grandma used to say, or y'all over there, hee hee and cock. Yeah, all right. You can do that. But those folks are not laughing with you. You see that Dallas point that just moved in your neighborhood? They ain't joking with you. And they can't wait to have you. That clinic, they ain't laughing with you. They can't wait to have you. That insurance, like, yo, these people are not laughing with you. They're not joking with you. They mean business. Like, seriously, they mean business. So, you, once again, think about the audacity. Think about the mindset that it takes to take a dialysis clinic and place it right next to a liquor store. Place it right next to a Chinese spot. Place it right next to a chicken spot. And then put that in the plaza. Think about the audacity and the lack of respect that they have for you when they do make moves like this. They're not joking with you. They want that money. They want that reimbursement. You can be mad about it as much as you want. You can shout and do all that things like they're like, yeah, OK, OK. Once we get you on the machine, eh, none of that stuff you're saying doesn't it doesn't matter. Once we get you in these medications, all that stuff doesn't matter. So we have to get back into the habit of fasting. Fasting was always our basic principles. Uh, fasting is our first line of offense and defense as pertains to all of these health conditions. You can don't. You know, people want to know what herbs should it take, uh, what vitamin supplement should it take. And I actually sell herbs. They're right here behind me. I actually sell herbs, right? So make sure you go to hbm.com if you want to check them out. But I actually sell herbs. But check this out. There's no pill out there. There's no uh, vitamin or mineral or herb out there that will do for your body what fasting will allow your body to do for itself. You dig what I'm saying? We, we're looking for magic. We're looking for magic. What I'm telling you is that you're looking for magic, but you are the magic. You're looking for magic. You're looking for all these gimmicks. Not, not everybody, but a lot of us are looking for like all these gimmicks and easy ways. But we are the magic. The things that your body will do when it is fasting is amazing. It is, it is magical in itself. You can take all the medications. You can take all the herbs. You can take all those things. But in order to fully optimize your body, to, to actually be able to experience experience what they call autophagy, uh, hormesis, uh, uh, lipogenesis, fasting allows you to go through those things. So fasting is extremely important. Drink water. 
uh, watch my video. I did a video called uh, Fasting Will Save the Black Community. I did a video called Fasting Will Save the Black Community. So check those videos out. Look, I'm not coming here to scare nobody. I'm coming here to empower. Um, I understand that a lot of this information is very you know, foreign and strange, and that's cool. But I need for you all to make sure you watch these videos and be serious. See, you love your mom, you love your dad, you love your grandma, you love your dad. They are actually a person to you, like they're humans to you, like you love them. Like they raise you, they change your diaper, they used to feed you, all those things, right? You love them, they're a person, they're not a number to you. Well, Dallas clinics don't care about that shit. They don't care about mama, they don't care about the blood pressure medication, they don't care about the side effects, none of that stuff, right? So if you want to protect yourself, your family, in the generations to come, we have to understand our bodies. We have to reach back, same Coke, we have to reach back and grab the wisdom that our ancestors have already left for us. All right? So, um, yo, that's it. I just really, we gotta push this in our community. Um, let's make fasting a part of our culture again. Make fasting a part of our culture again. Fasting is African as hell. Fasting will save the black community. I know it's to be a fact. I'm not talking about fasting and, and ketosis, and I'm not talking about fasting and any gimmicks. I'm talking about fasting as a norm. Go back and watch the video that I did called Fasting Will Save the Black Community. Like, I, I've done, I have the degree. Yeah, I'm a physician assistant. I'm a nutritionist. I'm a personal trainer. I did all these schoolings, paid all the money for these degrees and all those things, and I came out the other side only to tell you to do five things that are free. Fasting, sunlight, drink water, move. Um, Oh, whole foods. All right. So whole foods is not free, right? It's not free. But if you fasting, how much whole foods do you really need? How much fasting do you really need? I mean, how much food do you really need? It's going to dramatically cut back on the, the grocery bill. All right. So I appreciate y'all. I appreciate y'all, right? Please share this video. Please like this video. Please pass it out. Our community, our responsibility, we, we have what it takes. We don't need no big intervention from the outside. That shit ain't going to work. It's, we're going to get hustled. Trust me when I say that. We got to do for ourselves and there is no other way we have to do for ourselves and we start with the things that are practical and sustainable such as fasting all right so priest uh peace i love y'all i appreciate y'all share this video um i'm gonna go ahead and get off i'll be back on here tomorrow um talking about i don't know what i'm talking about um yeah intermittent fasting somebody's talking about intermittent fasting yeah so really all fasting is intermittent fasting because eventually you're going to eat again um, and those happens in interval unless you're just not going to eat again. All right. So um, please, if you have any questions about go and, and so I made a playlist. So I'll make a playlist and I'll save it to uh, Fly Newbie and Queens. Um, but if you want to, I've done 16, 17 videos. So pretty much any question that y'all probably going to ask right now, I already have it. Just go and check it out. Okay. Use, weaponize these videos. Weaponize these videos. All right. Please make sure you understand these videos. So if you got questions about fasting, I already made a video about fasting. Uh, if you have a question about blood pressure or diabetes, I already made a, uh, videos about blood pressure and diabetes, multiple. Um, if you have questions about the medical institution and why I tell you that you need to uh, get this information on your own, I did a video called Medical uh, Better Medications or Better Education. Um, if you have a question about our history uh, as African-Americans here in this country as pertains to the medical industry, I did two videos, one called uh, Say, uh, uh, the story of Anaka Westcott, um, and then uh, there's uh, Leaving Tuskegee. So go back and watch those videos, and I talk about medical apartheid. But um, the information is out there. Please utilize it, y'all. Please utilize it because, like I said, hey, you know, I would say, like, yo, Nipsey said, you know, don't pray for me, lie for me. Yo, share these videos, please. All right. So that's it. Our community, our responsibility. We have what it takes. My name is Edward Williams, founder and creative health by Necessary. Signing off. I'm going to holler at y'all tomorrow at 12. All right. Peace.